real um, thing that we do in Google, ten things that you should know about Jabra. Thank you. Um, yes, first thing, uh, this is a quite generic talk. Uh, I, di I, I gave pretty deep uh, presentations in the past in multiple conference, and I noticed that not everybody really understand uh, what Kerberos is or are confused by some part of it. I hope that this presentation will be beneficial both to people that actually know something of it or people that don't know anything or just people that have been confused of it. Uh, is there anybody that doesn't know at all what Kerberos is? Have a say next. Good. Okay. So, well, Kerberos is a network-oriented authentication protocol. Uh, and it has very many properties that whether you know or not are desirable for an organization. Unfortunately, it's not very well understood uh, in general and it doesn't buy. I know people think it's very difficult, it's something strange, but I believe it's just a matter of understanding uh, some key detail and everybody can really use it the way it should be used. So let's try to introduce the first point is what are the actors uh, in a Kerberized system? There are three main actors uh, and the most important one, if I can put it that way, is the KDC, the key distribution center. Um, and the other two actors, client or server, being on the network, that's what we have. And the aim is to be able to go and contact, connect a client to a server, be enabled for the server to authenticate the client, but also for the client to know that the server is what it claims to be. And all of this orchestrated through the KDC, which is a, a central shared key system uh, that holds the key of the uh, rail. Um, some of might think that something like this also happened in PKI system. If you know what a PKI system is, it's what you use usually on the internet to connect to websites. So there is a PKI system that guarantees that the website uh, that the secret for SSL is what you think it is. However, there's a key difference, and that's the word there, shared key system. In a PKI infrastructure, uh, the PKI server only gives you a guarantee that the keys are valid and trusted, but have no idea what those keys are. The keys are private uh, to the server or to the client, and it doesn't have any way uh, to know them. In a Kerber system, the KDC has all the keys. So it can actually impersonate users or servers if it wants to. And that's why usually it is uh, more appropriate for private organizations that have whole control of the system and where the trust is fully put in the administrator's hands. Okay, names. So, okay, I have this nice infrastructure, but how do I know who is who? I mean, what is uh, that identifies stuff? And everything in a Kerber system uh, is identified by name. Uh, the name is the uh, primary entity by which you reference uh, a server, a user, a service of some kind. And names are called principal names um, in a Kerberos system. So how do principal names look like? Well, they have some structure and you can see two main things in a, uh, in a principal name, um, which might confuse some people at times. Uh, one part, the first part, actually identifies the specific resource or user or et cetera. And there's the second part that's also very, very important, which is the real name. And the real name is what identifies which KDC or group KDC, what infrastructure these names are part of. And a lot of people tend to dismiss this part as uninteresting. Uh, uh, people think, well, you know, CMO at red but red doesn't really matter. I just 
take the CMO part, that's all I have to care about. Well, actually, that's not true because there are many more CMOs. Uh, I'm not the only one in the world. And the second part is really important, especially if you go into complex systems where you have multiple realms that actually talk to each other. Because this is a, an important thing that people tend to forget. Um, cables can have multiple KBCs around and they can actually trust each other. So when an application wants to know the actual identity of the users coming in, it has to take into account the realm part as well. So that part is, is fully part of, of the identifier. Um, well, I think I already talked about this. Um, the other part, the first part, is the uh, it's an identifier that identifies the actual source and usually uh, composed either a single component or multiple components that are separated by slashes. So this is how it looks like. Um, there are two different names you normally see. Um, the common one for users is the user principal. The first part is, is a very simple part, has just one string. I cannot have slashes in it. However, even for users, you can see the second form that is a little bit more interesting. The second form um, has two parts. You can see a slash there, so you can see a first part, uh, in this case, host, and the second part, in this case, um, a DNS name. Um, what does this mean? Uh, it doesn't really mean much by itself. It's just uh, a string in the end. And for the KBC, uh, it, it actually really doesn't care what form it takes, as long as the KBC can match that to something. Uh, but uh, there are conventions that will tell you what that actually means in actual users. Um, for example, when you want to contact a service, you have to somehow know what the service name is. Um, and usually the second form you see here is what we use to identify a service. In this case where host, uh, where I use the host as a service is I'm identifying an actual machine, the whole machine. And there are a bunch of services that might use this uh, name on the machine, um, but that just means that they are a single trust identity. Um, So how do I know what name to use to get somewhere? Well, this is just conventions. So the first part uh, that in the example was like host uh, has to be known by the client application. Uh, there is no way around it. Uh, for, so for example, there are conventions for how you contact an HTTP server. In that case, the first part here will be HTTP. The second part also is a convention, and in, a, in existing Kerber systems, that convention is normally that the second part is the machine fully qualified domain name. And so when you want to connect as a user to a, a web server, for example, what your client will do behind the scene is, well, I know that I'm going to call HTTP, so I take HTTP first, and then, oh, I know that the server is myserver.example.com, and we'll type slash myserver.example.com, and, of course, the realm. Uh, you have also to know what is the realm, and that will be derived usually from the actual domain name as, as well. But that can be a little bit complicated. Uh, maybe if you're interested, you can ask me later. Um, and so why do we need to use these conventions? Can I... Can't I just ask the service that I connect to what is its name? Well, generally the answer is no. And the reason is that before you authenticate to something, you cannot trust what it is telling you. So if you ask the target service, and there have been important CVEs coming out of this, who you are, uh, then the user doesn't really know what it is connecting to. So say I want to go to 
<coughs> my server.example.com. And I don't want to give the convention and say, well, why don't I ask the web server who that is? No, okay. E minus, apply me my server.example.com and all is fine. Now, assume that I have instead top, top secret .com and, you know, public.example.com. Now, if I ask uh, public.example.com who you are, or sorry, yeah, uh, top secret.example.com who you are, and it replies me public.example.com, then I will, I will think that I'm connecting to top secret, but instead, under the, underneath my client, who tries to use a key that is used by a public server. That means I can basically uh, play uh, games with names if I do this, and I can be redirected to services that are not what was my intention to connect to. Uh, so in general, you cannot do that, and you have to live by these conventions that they may, may be quite annoying sometimes. Uh, because the, you, everybody wants to play games like you putting uh, load balancers on front of servers, they want to be able to dynamically switch where packets go and stuff like that. And it's a little, dif little bit difficult sometimes to understand from the client point of view what is the actual server I want to connect to. Uh, so you need to understand uh, how the name is derived to understand what you can or cannot do when you want to use Kerberos for this uh, for authentication. <coughs> Okay, so the next step is, um, okay, now say that I somehow understood what the name is, uh, how do I actually do authentication? We'd say that Kerber is a shared key system, and there are two types of secrets in Kerberos. Um, one type is password, just the password that usually users use. Uh, and there are cryptographically random blobs, and it's usually what are given to services. Why I divide it in two classes? Uh, actually, from the point of view of the KDC, there isn't much of a difference, but the main difference is that usually uh, password to use a much reduced set of uh, bytes, and so they create keys that are a little, little bit weaker than what uh, randomly generated randoms are. And so there are some attacks uh, to try to brute force uh, tickets, and we'll see what are that later. Um, okay, so these keys, uh, whether they are passwords or secrets, are all held in the KDC, and they're associated with the principle they refer to. So for a password, there will be a user principle like Com, for example, and my key will be associated with that principle. Uh, for a host, there will be a random blob that is associated with the host principle. And on the, yeah, that's it. The, the, the strange thing is that princes might have multiple keys as well, and that might be a technicality, we'll see later why. Um, as a user, I know my password. I know it in my head. And when the system prompts me, I can type it. And that's how I get access to the system. Um, for services like web servers, SSHD, or other things, they also need a secret, but they also need to store it somewhere because there's an object to type it, uh, type it in interactively. Um, so those secrets are usually stored in key tabs, uh, which are usually files. But the very important thing that many people do not understand when you try to deploy Kerberos initially is that key tabs are really um, password equivalent things, if you want to uh, put it that way. What that means that key tabs are not things that you can re expose on, uh, on the system or, or rather user or send by email or stuff like that because exposing a key tab means you basically destroy the security of the whole system. Uh, the system relies on all the keys to be kept either in the KDC or private to the user or the service that is, are using them. And so if you expose them, you broke the security. Okay. Well, 
doesn't even work. Okay, I can't see it anymore now. Okay, so how does it all come together? Um, something happened to my slides. Okay, okay. Um, so start for Kitab. Uh, so if you look at, at, a, at a Kitab and a system, this is what you will see. And um, it's interesting because you can see that you have multiple entries in a Kitab. And I told you that a service user have one secret. But I also told you that a principal can have multiple keys associated. So this is how it all come together. The thing is that Kerberos uh, tried to be uh, as much as possible future proof. And one of the features it has is that it can have multiple uh, encryption algorithms used and more add as the time passes. So initially there was just uh, this. That was the first uh, encryption algorithm used. Then other were add, that's three, AES, um, and various flavors. Then there are new ones like Camellia, and we're thinking of adding more things going forward. So what happens when you create a secret for a service is that uh, multiple keys are generated from that secret, are derived from that secret. And the reason is that you might have some clients that understand the very latest uh, algorithm and you want to use that because it's stronger and creates uh, you know, better session keys. Uh, but it might be you have older clients that understand only a subset of those algorithms. So you need the, the KDC need to be able to provide you uh, a way for two uh, machines or a, a client server that you understand different sets of algorithms to somehow find one that is common to both and be able to talk to each other. So what happens is that on many systems you have multiple encryption algorithms uh, activated. Uh, in this case, you will not see this because we basically killed it or hope so. Um, the very last service that really prevented us from killing was NFS and we fixed it uh, already in RHEL 6, so hopefully we'll not see this anymore here. But um, other thing that you can see in Akita, but it gives you a lot of information is the first column, KV no, is very, very, very important. Uh, this confuses a lot of people and it allows you to solve a lot of problems when you're dealing with why this thing is not working. So KV no means um, key version number. And it's basically kind of a time st or epoch number that tells you how many times the, the service got a new key. So every time the service re-keys or some admin gets a new key for a specific principle, the KDC increases this number. Uh, so the second time you get two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera. And so if the admin by mistake changed the keys in the KDC, but didn't copy the key tab on the machine, um, what happens is that the KDC has the key that is different for, from what the servers understand the key to be. And there is a command that you can use, it's called kvno, to find out what the KDC believe the version number for the keys are, and then you can compare the number to the key you have in the server, you said, aha, that's why nothing works, because we are not talking the, you know, the same key. So that's very important. Um, other thing, okay, times and dates can tell you something about that. The principle, of course, very important. You want to make sure that if you're using, uh, uh, if you're trying to curb as a web server, you get the right principle, which should be HTTP slash name of the server at real. If you see a different name there, uh, things will probably not work because clients will not try to get a ticket for this name, for example, for an HTTP server, this is clearly a name that can be used only by SSH or maybe other services that run SSH. So this convention. Um, so these are things that really help you try to understand and wrap your head around why uh, you might have some problems. Uh, the second part is not very common. I put there because it is possible to do so and sometimes people do so. Uh, it's a key tab, but not for a, normally for a service, it actually represents a user identity. So there's no reason why a user has to use 
uh, actual password, a user might decide user key. That's, that's not what user key that are usually used for. Uh, they're usually used for system user key. Like I have an application that has to behave as a, as a client for another one, but I don't want to give that application for whatever reason uh, a real uh, service key, maybe because I have an NFS server and I want that application to actually have a user identity in the posit realm as well. So I use a compromise where I create a user I, uh, key, a uh, user principle, but then I store its key slash password into a key tab and give it to an application. Um, usually in that case, you only need one encryption type because uh, you don't care of being very compatible. Usually it's targeted to a, to a service that you know will, will, will support it and use the strongest one you can. So that's, yeah, helpful. Um, so, tickets. So far we discussed about names, about keys, but still how does it, all this thing get together? How do we actually go from, from knowing the name I want to connect to and from knowing that each one, each one has keys and getting authentication all the way through. Well, that's shown through ticket. And the core is just that if you can read the ticket, you can consider the authentication to have uh, successful, has been successful. Um, so grid simplifying, uh, a ticket is a short-lived document that the KBC returns to a client after positive authentication and allows a client to connect to a specific service. Well, this positive authentication is glossed over a little bit, and I'm also simplifying really many things. If you know Kerberos, you will kill me for saying something like this, but uh, you may ask questions if you want, so if you really want to <laughs> make your life difficult now or later. And the other thing also great simplifying is that the tickets are cryptographic documents that only the KDC and the two parties of the communication uh, can properly decrypt. And I won't tell you how the crypto works, all of that. I mean, yes, we can go down to those details. I don't think that's really important. I mean, either you trust me or you trust me because <laughs> seriously, I mean, it's math, it's hard. <laughs> so, uh, how are tickets exchanged? And this, finally we get into the, uh, into the meat here. So, it's actually very simple at a conceptual level. Um, you have a client, and here we assume the, the client already got something that is called the TGT, ticket granting ticket. Uh, we just assume that it is, and maybe we get into that later. It's not really important. It's what you get uh, if you know Kerberos when you do K in it on the common line and you type your password. What happens is that this TGT gets dropped into your client. And that's your main proof of authentication against the KDC, which is where you go when you want to ask tickets for some service you want to connect to. So we figure out the name of the target we want to go to. We know we have our own nice TGT, we know that the server has its own key tab with, all, with, with this stuff, and now we want to actually go and talk to that server. And the first time, what we do is, okay, who's the only sister that knows all the keys and can somehow connect uh, us together? And that's the KDC. So we go to the KDC and ask, uh, please uh, give me a ticket for server. Uh, and in that case, server will be the principal name we decide is the name of the target. Um, everything between brackets, you should consider it somehow encrypted, uh, possibly multiple times or possibly different parts with different keys without going detail. Uh, the KDC at this point will just say, okay, here it is. This is your ticket. So you have this nice ticket, and then you turn to the other side, you go to the server, and say, hey, I have this ticket. You like it? And the server will do some crypto work on its side using the key tab it has and the ticket you provide, you provide and will reply to you and say, yeah, sure. It will also generally give you back another little uh, encrypted blob that you can verify and you will be able to say, 
and yeah, you are free to use service. So at that point, after the second exchange, you not only are authenticated to the server on the other side, you're really sure that that server is what you want to talk to. This is something that is usually lost, for example, when GCP API is used, is used on HTTP, but it's not there. So, yep. The server has a key tab. Yeah, yeah, so I say I forgot the bracket. Uh, I trust you and I am the server should be between brackets. Uh, basically, yeah, the reply is encrypted with a session key, which is what is deeply concealed within the ticket it just gave to the server. And only you and the server can get to this key, and so that's how the verification uh, works. I mean, yes, the crypto, I, I removed the crypto from the slides, so. But if you have questions, feel free to ask me. Nope, that's a great question. So one of the things is that tickets are valid for a period of time. And that's completely configurable. Uh, normally, uh, it may, might vary between a few hours and a few weeks. Um, the MIT Kerberos, for example, by default configuration gives, it, gives out tickets as valid for 10 hours. Um, Active Directory, I think, gives out Ticket TDTs at least are valid for a week. Uh, there are also other things like being able to renew tickets by asking again to the KDC. Um, but yes, in general, you have to, uh, and also you can, the client can also decide, well, I want a shorter ticket. I can ask the KDC, give me a ticket only about five minutes, for example. So yes, there is an expiration. The second important point is because there is this expiration, you can use these tickets to talk to the server for all the time until it expires. You don't go to the KDC anymore. So once you've done the first thing once, you don't do it anymore until the ticket expires. And if the ticket expires, you try to talk to the server, the server will say, sorry, your ticket expired. I mean, it could be a very nice and all, but it's expired. Uh, so yeah, you, the server has to enforce that in that case. Question? Uh, okay, that's that, that's complicated. So, yes, but the answer is complex. Uh, there are many ways to go about that. What you're really really asking to is, can I have a farm of servers that are all authenticated using the same mechanism without ha me having to think too much about that? Now there are multiple ways. You could use, for example, C names in DNS, and so the client will know at each each time which server you're talking to. So each server has a different key tab, and you as a user don't really care what's happening. Uh, if you are connecting to different servers every time, your client knows which server is contacting. So we use different tickets, one for each server. However. <coughs> Right, as I, I said, C names. The other case is where you actually really want to conceal completely from the client that there are multiple servers. Yeah, like for example, I have a load balancer, so I want to give a name to the load balancer, but then I have multiple servers. Well, in that case, what you're really doing at the trust level is that you're trusting all the servers are the same thing. So th what you want to do in that case is to share the same key tab between multiple servers. At that point, it doesn't really matter which server you're talking to, they are all able to decrypt the same ticket. So it's really a, a matter of it deciding how you put the trust in the single servers and how you want to architect your stuff. So there are possibilities, but you, you know, how you solve the problem de might depend on the architecture you choose. Uh, so, point seven, which is really important. How do I deploy these things? Well, do not try to do it on your own. Seriously, I've done it multiple times, and it sucks. Actually, I started a project called Free IPA, uh, which
which does a number of other things that you really want to do when you have some uh, complex infrastructure. But you know, if you don't like that or uh, that IBM, use AV or use something else made by someone that knows what he's doing because setting up a Kubernetes infrastructure is hard. Of course, you need to know at least to some degree how it works because you need to, you know, maybe debug some problem on the network and trying to fix issues, but I, I really suggest that you at least, especially if you're starting, try to use something to set everything up for you and get it right so that you don't have to uh, get mad and hate it, right? Because that's why people hate it. It's hard to set up manually, so don't do it. Um, so how do I use Kerber instead if I'm a developer? Well, don't use it. <laughs> that's the point. Try to use something that's called GSS API. So you will have libcurbify on your machine, and you can try to play with knit or all, you know, open the key tabs, try to see this or that. But that's really hard and error prone. So it's a, something simple called GSS API. Um, use it. Um, so how, what is this GSS API, and why should I care about that? Well. You can think of GSS API as a specialization of Kerberos or other things, which can create a second channel between two application, a client and a server application. I have to say it doesn't have 100% fu the full flexibility of Kerberos. There are some old protocols that do things like using UDP packets, and they don't really create second channels. So for those cases, you wouldn't use it. But for the modern case, that's rarely the case. Uh, so use GSS API, it is mechanism neutral, but it means that in GSS API there is a concept of, uh, well, yes, although it has been built primarily to you, the, the, for being used for Kerberos, it can be used for with ad other authentication mechanisms, so if you create your application and use just GSS API, the very nice side effect is not only that you will uh, be able to be Kerberized, is that you can do also other things, like uh, SPNego is just another wrapper around multiple mechanisms or a TLM SSV if you need to talk to Windows machines and they have some, you know, problems with Kerberos or also new stuff like GSS, GSS EAP, uh, which I'm not going into details, but it's a very interesting protocol. Um, the stars are where we don't actually have an implementation of that in the standard libraries. Um, not that we don't have an implementation, it's not in the, usually in the OSs, I actually created a, something called GSS and TLM SSP and pushed it to Fedora 20. Uh, GSS AP also exists, uh, but it's not packaged as it for Fedora. But yeah, it's, a, it's nice to have the option. Um, so why GSS API? Because it gives you in a very simple, relatively simple API, uh, not only the mutual authentication that Kerberos can provide to you, which is what was that exchange where, you know, you know who you are and be, we love each other, but you also get integrity, which means you can, after you've done the authentication, you can sign everything is going over the wire between the two uh, client server, or confidentiality, meaning I can also can encrypt everything. So by the simple fact that I've done this authentication with the, the two parties, uh, a session key is set up between us and we can use that key to either just make sure that the content of the communication isn't touched or that the, the content of the communication is confidential. Uh, there are other things that can go on there, but they're not really important. Um, so this is why I say it's simple. I mean, this is really, in essence, what you need to do if you're a developer. On the client side, you just call in a loop the first one until the, the context is established. And on the server, you just call this, this other function, the accept the context in a loop until the context is established. And once that is done, the authentication is done. So if, so if these functions are, the, if these functions succeed, the authentication has happened. Um, there are, of course, other functions if you want to expect what happened in the authentication, if you have special properties, but those are not really fundamental. And so after authentication, if you want to transmit data securely, you can use those two functions uh, on both sides. Um, can you spot the lie on the slide? 
I said it's simple. Okay, so last thing uh, before we're done. This is not really part of Kerberos necessarily, but it's a thing I've been working on, and I think I talked about this last year, um, and I tried to push people to use it. It's, uh, it's called Jesus Proxy, but the important part is the privilege separation. So all, all I said uh, was that you give key tabs to application, you give keys to application. However, uh, sometimes you, you don't trust the application of 100%. For example, if you have an Apache server where you have multiple applications that need to, that you want to curbize, you don't want to have each of them having access to the key because then they can then play tricks. Now, if, some, if one of the applications is compromised, they can contact the other application and pretend to be users. So there is this nice tool called user proxy that allow you, but only if you use a true digest API, to remove the key from the application, and the whole thing will keep working, except that the application will not be able to play tricks uh, uh, with other applications that need to share the same key. Uh, this is also interesting, for example, in the case where we say that you share the key within multiple servers. And yep, that's it. Uh, if you have any question now or later, otherwise, that's it. Right, yes, yes. All the modern browsers support this API. Um, they actually support SPNego, uh, which is a wrapper in this API that can use multiple protocols, but yes, they do. And not only that, I tested JSS proxy with a Firefox in order to remove my user key, and it also works, so it's cool. Questions? Oh, uh, yeah, I think that's for another talk. <laughs> no, we can talk about that later, but that's a long debate. <laughs> yeah, well, there are good reasons, but I mean, public key crypto is fantastic. Uh, maybe a little bit slow in cases, but I don't think it's part of this talk, <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, well, if you're passing a password or the wire, and this may be I didn't make clear, you're basically defeating the whole point of Kerberos because. One of the points of Kerberos is that your keys never leave your hands. Uh, the KDC knows the keys, you know the keys, but they never go over the network. I, I only discuss about tickets going over the network. In the tickets, there are no keys. So we can discuss about that later. We have ideas about that, but it's not about Kerberos anymore once you don't have the tickets. Okay, question? Uh, well, why not? Cecil wraps also just API, so if you really use Cecil and that means Cecil plain or Cecil, Cecil something special, sure, because then I can plug just API into it that you wouldn't know. Absolutely, yeah. Cecil is another way to use also just API and also other methods. I mean, there are, there are Few things interesting there too, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I guess I just disconnect because this thing went out and I couldn't see anything. <laughs> Maybe I should turn it off.